Good morning, Forward Church. Welcome to Church Online. I want to be one of the first to say to you, Merry Christmas. Now, I know Christmas isn't for another couple of days, but this is our Christmas service here at Forward Church, and I want to let you know that I am praying for you, praying for your family, and hoping that this Christmas is the best Christmas yet. You know, today as we go into this Christmas message, we're actually reading from Matthew's Gospel, Matthew chapter 2. And as we're reading, we're looking at the life of a man by the name of Herod. Now, history knows Herod as Herod the Great. He was a great builder and reformer in the first century BC. However, Herod was not only referred to as Herod the Great, but he was also pretty cruel, pretty evil in many cases. And today as we look at the life of Herod, we're going to see how Herod responded to the news of the birth of Jesus. The reason that that's important for you and for me is really simple. The story of Christmas is the story of people responding to Jesus. That's really what it means to be a Christian by and large. It means that we respond to Jesus. And so today as we look in Matthew chapter 2, we're going to take a look at how Herod responds to the news of Jesus. Matthew chapter 2 says it this way. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. See, the story of the birth announcement of Jesus to Herod is actually not just the birth announcement of Jesus, but it's actually the toddlerhood announcement of Jesus. See, most Bible historians see that what has happened here is that Jesus has already been born, and it's taken a little while for the wise men to travel from the east to Jerusalem to search out for Jesus. As a matter of fact, Herod will eventually send out a decree to have all of the male children aged two and under killed. And most scholars believe that the reason that he had male children aged two and under killed was because whenever they ascertained the time of the birth of Jesus from the wise men, they realized that it was approximately two years, give or take a few months, after the initial birth of Jesus. So I always like to joke with people this way and say that if you've got a nativity scene at your house, you need to make sure that the wise men are not in the scene yet. Because on the night in which Jesus was born, the wise men weren't there. The wise men were still well, well to the east. So if you've got a nativity set, make sure that you put the wise men in a totally different room because they're not there just yet, okay? So what happens is Jesus is born really to obscurity whenever it comes to the life of Herod. So if you read in Luke's Gospel, you see the other accounts of the night of the birth of Jesus, and you see that it was shepherds that were told of the birth of Jesus. And the shepherds, they do show up on the night of the birth of Jesus, and they do see the newborn king. Well, these wise men, they're, they're well, they're hundreds, thousands potentially miles away when they see in the sky this peculiar star now, in the ancient times, and even in our modern times with many cultures, people would judge great events by things that happen in the sky. We see that happening today in our modern world. People check their uh, astrology, their horoscope, all the time. Well, that's what was happening with these wise men. They were astrologers. They saw this peculiar star. They associated it with the birth of a king, and they traveled to Jerusalem. Now, the Bible says that when they got to Jerusalem, which was the capital of Israel, the capital of Judea, they go to the palace and they find King Herod, and they ask him, where is the newborn king? And I just want to stop for a moment and remind you of what happened a few years ago whenever we had a new royal baby born. Now, since that first newest of the royal babies was born, there have been a series of other royal babies born, and it seems like every time the world stops like we're all leaning in and anticipating the birth of this kid. 
and there are, it's on tabloids, it's on TV shows, it's on social media because everybody's excited about the birth of a royal baby. Well, these wise men, these king, kingly rulers, they come traveling looking for this newborn king. They go into the palace because after all, where would a king be born? He would be born around the palace area. And they go to the palace and they ask Herod, who was the king at the time, where's your baby? Where's the heir to the throne? And the Bible says something very interesting here in verse 3. It says, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Herod was troubled for this reason. If a new king was born, then that meant that he would eventually be replaced. It was interesting that the Bible says that all of Jerusalem was at troubled with Herod as well. See, the reason all of Jerusalem was troubled with Herod is Herod was really a bad guy. Herod was actually a very, very bad tyrant. He actually murdered people who he felt were a threat to his throne. And not just people. Check this out, y'all. Herod actually, he was married multiple times, and he actually murdered his favorite wife. Her name was Mariamne. He actually murdered his favorite wife. Prior to being married to Mariamne, he had another wife and a son with this wife, and he banished them from the kingdom because he didn't want to have anything to do with them anymore and didn't want them to be part of his kingdom. Eventually, Herod would even go so far as to murder three, not one, not two, three of his very own sons because he felt that they were threats to his throne. When Herod died, uh, he actually told people in his royal court that on the day of his death that they were to round up a few hundred of the highest of the nobility of all of the Jewish people in Jerusalem and kill them in a mass killing on the day he was born. That way he could ensure that all of Jerusalem would mourn and would never forget the day when Herod died. He was terrible. He was a megalomaniac. He was a tyrant. He was power hungry. And so the reason that all Jerusalem is fearful, is troubled, the same way that Herod is troubled, is because they know when Herod starts getting on a rampage, there's no telling how bad the repercussions are going to be. See, he gets the news of Jesus, but instead of seeing it as the good news of God's salvation, what he sees it as is a threat to his throne. I see that happen to us all the time. Now, we're not leaders. We're not kings of nations. We're not the king of Judah. We're not the king of Israel. We're not Caesar or anybody like that. But, but we all are kind of kings of our own lives. We're kings of our family. And in many cases, we lead in our jobs. We, we have children. We have people that are kind of working with and under us. And, and the most important part of this is we really are kind of the kings of our own lives. We decide what we want to do when we want to do it, and in many cases, even how we want to do it. See, we lead our own lives. And when Jesus comes in, the Bible tells us that Jesus is the Lord. And for Jesus to be the Lord, that is him living out his kingship over your life and over mine. And what I found is, for my life, far too often, I respond like Herod. And instead of coming to worship Jesus like the wise men did, like the Magi did, I try to destroy Jesus like Herod did. Let's look a little further. Verses 3 and following says this, When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. See, the scene shifts here. Actually, in what I just read, there's two different things that happen. 
First, King Herod assembles the religious leader, the scribes and the, the, the chief priests of the people, and he asks them, where is the Christ to be born? It's pretty interesting that Herod would use the term Christ. See, Herod is not fully Jewish. He's actually kind of teetering on this half-Jewish, half-Gentile place with his race. And that's why he married his former wife. That's why he married the woman that I talked about earlier, Mary Omni, because she was Jewish. And he married her in order to join himself and to have allegiance and be accepted more by the Jewish people. See, Herod had this problem. He, wa he wasn't Jewish enough to be accepted by the Jewish people, yet he wasn't Roman enough to be accepted by the Romans. So Herod was kind of in this in-between place of his life. And so what he does is he assembles the chief priests and the scribes together, and he asks them, where is the Christ going to be born? See, this is critical to understanding the interpretation of this passage because it tells us something. It tells us that Herod acknowledged, at least he acknowledged it with his mouth if he didn't acknowledge it with his heart, that Herod acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ, that when these wise men from the east came with their caravan bringing frankincense, gold, and myrrh, when these wise men came from the east, Herod realized that this was something significant on the world stage. And he understood, like I said, at least with his mouth, if not with his heart, that this was significant. And he asked where the Christ was to be born. Now, these chief priests and scribes, they immediately go to the prophets. See, there's this tiny prophetic promise in, the, in a small Old Testament book called Micah. And in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, it actually says, And you, O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, from you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people. And traditionally, the Jewish people have used that to identify with David because David was possibly the greatest king in their history. And David was born in Bethlehem as a shepherd. And David eventually would rise up to be, like I said, potentially the greatest king that Israel had ever known. And from David's line, there would be this messianic kingdom promise of a king, a ruler, always being on the throne. And so Herod recognizes that this child that has been born is significant. He is important. He's not just important in the sense of what you and I would say important, but he has global and godly significance. He is the Christ that's to be born. And so he assembles these chief priests and he finds out where he's going to be. And then the second part of the scene happens. Then it says that he secretly called the wise men back in. I want you to just picture what's happening in this royal court. Before, there's this huge caravan, and these magi from the east come searching for this newborn king. See, many of us, we've Americanized the story of the nativity. And we typically think that when the wise men came, that there were only three of them. Now, the reason we think that is because of the, the gifts that they brought. They brought three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. However, the Bible doesn't say that there were only three. More than likely, this was a royal entourage. This was a great caravan. And so we're talking 20, 30, potentially 40 people. This is a huge ordeal of people coming from the ancient east to find this king. So imagine the city of Jerusalem when this is going on, when they see this outside procession coming in. I think about the times in my life when I've been to Washington, D.C., there have been a handful of times when I've been in D.C. and the president has actually been going from maybe the Capitol building or, or, or somewhere like that and there's been a motorcade going on. Anytime that that happens, the Secret Service and the local police shut down the streets, they're barricading stuff off, and they're making sure that the people are kind of at a safe distance away from, from the president. Well, it's important because there's this dignitary, but not only does that happen, but people, y'all know how we are, we get nosy and we start kind of looking around trying to see what's going on and a crowd starts to form. Well, that's what's happening in Jerusalem. They see all of these camels coming in from the east and these, these, uh, these uh, ex exotic looking people that are coming into town that are these outsiders and they go to the palace. They know something big is happening and something big's going on. So what does Herod do? Herod secretly calls the wise men back in because he doesn't want to create a bigger stir than it really is. See, Herod understands something. In the ancient Near East, and really not just the ancient Near East, in ancient times, 
if you could get a mob mentality to happen, it would snowball to this place of revolution. And so Herod quietly brings these wise men in so that no one else in Jerusalem hears that there's a new king born. Because after all, Herod wasn't Jewish enough to be accepted by the Jewish people. The Jewish people actually hated and despised Herod. And so he knew that if the Jewish people could see that their Christ, their Savior, their Messiah, which is the Hebrew way of saying Christ, which really means the anointed one of God, it was an old title that was used of kings and of priests. If these Jewish people saw that the Christ was really born, it would not take a lot for that to generate and grow in momentum into a frenzy. And sooner or later, they would storm the palace and they would remove Herod. So he calls these wise men in secretly and he says, Hey, go to Bethlehem. And when you find the child, hey, come back and let me know because I want to worship him. The truth is, Herod didn't want to worship Jesus. Herod wanted to kill Jesus. As a matter of fact, look with me in the Bible at verse 16 of Matthew chapter 2. Look at what it says. Matthew 2, 6, 16 says this. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. See, Herod, he lied to these guys. He tries to gather them in secret and under the guise of worship. He claims that he wants to go and pay homage to this new king. But really, he just wants to remove him. Because at the end of the day, Herod was threatened by power. He was power hungry. He didn't want to give up control. He didn't want to be replaced because he had a place and he didn't want anybody to replace him with a new kingdom, with a new king. Guys, he killed his favorite wife. He killed three of his sons. He kills multiple children throughout Bethlehem, all because he's not willing to bow to the new kingdom and the new king that God has brought into place. So when you zoom out and you look at the overall context of the Gospel of Matthew, here's what you see. The Gospel of Matthew, one of the primary things that it does is it shows us that Jesus is the king of kings, the king of the Jews, the savior of the world. And so what you see is this replacement motif where Herod was once reigning, now God has a son, Jesus, who will reign. Where Caesar was once lord of the world, now you have the Messiah, the savior, Jesus, who will be the lord of all the earth. And so Herod does everything in his power to kick against this. He does everything in his power to try to save his power, and he ultimately ends up resisting the very power of God. Now, as we've talked about Herod's story, I just want to ask you, what is your story? Yeah, you're not the king of, of Judah. You're not reigning in Jerusalem. You, you may not even... You may not even be a manager at your job. You may not even be an assistant to the manager. I, I don't know what you are or what's going on with you, but here's what I do know. The story of Christmas is the story of people responding to the news of Jesus. And so I want to ask you, how are you responding to the news of Jesus? All throughout the nativity story, you see people responding to the news of Jesus. You see... Mary is approached by an angel, and she responds to the news of Jesus. Joseph, whose world is shaken, and he feels betrayed, and he's confused, and doesn't understand what's going on, he still receives a prophetic dream from an angel, and he responds to the news of Jesus. We see even the magi, or the wise men that we talked about today, coming from the east. They saw a global phenomenon in the sky, and they knew that there was a king to be born, and so they responded to the news about Jesus. We see Herod, who has travelers coming from a long way away. He gathers the chief priests and the scribes of the people, the religious elite, to find out that the Christ will be born. And he puts two and two together to realize that the Christ not only will be born, but has been born in Bethlehem. And he has a choice to respond 
to Jesus and he doesn't respond in the healthy and the accurate way. My question for you is how are you responding? As you've heard me talk about Jesus and him being the king of your life and him being the king of your family and the king of your finances and the, the king of, of your world, how are you responding? See, there were two groups of people here in this message that we've talked about today. There are wise men that go to worship Jesus. But then on the other hand, there's Herod, who hears of Jesus but refuses to worship. And ultimately, friends, at the end of the day, that's what separates every human on the face of the planet, is how will we respond to Jesus Will we worship him? Will we come to him for forgiveness of our sins? Will we come to him and trust him to be the Lord of our life? Or will we, like Herod, want to have nothing to do with him and actually try to get rid of him? My prayer for you this Christmas is really my prayer for me and my prayer for my family and, and, and really my prayer for all of us that, that we are ministering to as a church is that we respond the right way to Jesus and that is through repentance and through faith and through submission and surrender to his will let me tell you something at the end of the day when we all examine our lives what matters most is that we respond in a healthy way to Jesus let's pray together Heavenly Father I thank you for your son Jesus God, my prayer today is that we would respond to Jesus in an accurate and in a life-giving way. Give us the faith to bow our knees to him. Give us the faith, give us the surrender. Help us to not hold on to being the king of this world, but rather may we let go and trust Jesus as the king of all the world and every world that is to come. God, let us not be like Herod, but rather let us be like all those who responded positively to the news of the Savior of the world. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Guys, thank you for spending today with me. Merry Christmas to you. Speaking of Merry Christmas, as we prepare to receive tithes and offering today, I want you to know something. Forward Church, you came together like you always come together. Because of you, one family has had Christmas taken care of completely. Now let me tell you something, guys. We're talking, I just got through talking about how important it is to respond to Jesus. That's a response. That's a response to Jesus that you are able to continue to give money and not just give money, but several of you actually purchased gifts that we were able to give to this family so they could make sure that their kids had a Christmas this year. And so guys, I love you and I appreciate you and I wanna say thank you for that. And I also wanna let you know that man, as you give, I want you to know my promise. My promise to you is as a leader of Forward Church, we're gonna do everything in our power to make sure that the money that you sow into this ministry goes on to God's mission to make a difference in this world. And so as you give, I want you to know that you're giving to build God's kingdom and you're giving to overpopulate heaven and to make an eternal difference. And so thank you guys. We couldn't do it without your generous donations and gifts. So I love you. I wanna say thank you. Thank you for giving, and just know this, that we are, not we will be, we are making a difference. So guys, I love you so much. Can't wait to see you next week right here again at Church Online. We'll see you then, guys. Bye.